I still really dislike villagers. I know what you must be thinking. Like, dude, didn't you just make a whole video about this? At some point, maybe you just need therapy or something. And you're right. I spent the whole last video designing my perfect trading hall. Then it took me over a month to build it in game, including moving my base, building a bunch of supporting farms, and those streams of me digging a hole for almost six hours that I didn't even end up using. So yeah, I'm a little obsessed. And don't get me wrong, the trading hall works great. It's these guys that are the problem. Even after being locked up, chemically altered, and healed multiple times, they still have the audacity to lock their trades after I have traded with them too much, which of course is totally unacceptable. So I'm going to fix it. We are going to design and build a system that implements instant void trading in the overworld with a simple and compact layout that can be installed in any trading hall. Then we will install it in the system and finally go through the entire trading hall and show an overview of the system design as I promised in the last video. After all of this, the villager problems should be completely solved. So let's get right into it. The first thing you might be wondering is, what is void trading? Well, in short, it's a technique to trick villagers from remembering that they have traded with you, which allows you to prevent them from locking their trades. This is very useful for when buying bulk items as you can trade with them as many times as you want very quickly. The mechanic behind this is that we open the trading menu with the villager, then transport ourselves, the villager, or both far away from each other, which unloads the villager, and then we finish our trade. Since the villager is unloaded during the actual trade, it does not quote unquote remember that it has traded with the player, so the trades remain unlocked. The reason why this is commonly called void trading is because it was popularized when Cubic Meter and Dr. Rush innovated it using end gateways. This type of void trading with end gateways is very smooth, and in my mind is undoubtedly the best way to do void trading, as it is very fast and easy to perform. The biggest problem is that if you want to implement this in your trading hall, then you need to build your trading hall in the end, and I personally don't want to do that. I believe that there are two types of systems that are required in every base, a storage system and a trading hall. Furthermore, there is no reason why void trading or infinite trading must be in the end. The only requirement regarding dimension is that the villager and the player must stay in the same dimension throughout the entire process. Ian XO4 in his typical fashion came up with a simple solution for implementing infinite trading in the overworld. His system just uses minecarts and rails to push the player and the villager away from each other until the villager is unloaded. This is a really clever system, particularly for early game, but you can probably imagine the issue with trying to implement a system like this in a compact automated style trading hall. It just takes too much space. So are there other solutions? What we need to do is to transport the player and the villager away from each other in the overworld, preferably very quickly. Is there a good way to do this? Well, yes. Ender pearls, for one. Using ender pearl stasis chambers, we can travel hundreds of blocks instantaneously, giving us the ability to unload the villager very quickly. It's a nice option, but it's also more complicated than it first appears. To explain fully, we need to look a little bit into how Minecraft loads and unloads chunks. Chunks, for those of you who don't know, are how Minecraft splits up the world. You can easily see them by pressing F3 and G at the same time. One chunk is 16 blocks by 16 blocks and goes from bedrock to build limit. As you move around the world, the game loads and unloads these chunks based on how far they are from you. This includes any entities like villager, mobs, items, etc. that are in these chunks. The loading distance is based on the simulation distance that your game is using. The default for Java in single player is 12 chunks and 10 for servers. But this depends on the actual game or server settings, so you need to check these. So how is this value applied in game? Well, for example, if we use a five chunk simulation distance, it loads the chunk that the player is in and then five on each side of the player in a square pattern, meaning that it's an 11 by 11 chunk square that is loaded. These are the fully loaded chunks. 
otherwise called entity ticking chunk, meaning that all normal game functions work in this area. Outside this square, we have a layer of one chunk that still processes some functions, but does not process entities. These are often called the redstone processing chunks because redstone still works here. Finally, we have one more layer outside the redstone processing chunks that are called the border chunks and only process very limited game functions. The two outside layers of chunks are commonly called lazy chunks because entities like mobs and items are not processed here. A key concept is that although the lazy chunks do not process entities, they still do consider these entities loaded, or at least partially loaded. For instance, mob switches work in these chunks because mobs here count towards the mob cap. Quick note of clarification here. The numbers used in the prior example are only applicable to servers. The single player simulation distance you set in your menu is actually a little bit less than the equivalent for servers. To convert them, it's just the single player simulation distance minus two. So the example before with a simulation distance of five on a single player world would load a seven by seven of entity ticking chunks, not an 11 by 11, which you would get on servers. For our purposes, we need to make sure that when we do infinity trading, that the villager is located outside all of the loaded chunks, including the lazy chunks, in order to completely unload the villager. So when using stasis chambers, we want to position two chambers that are far enough apart so that we will unload the villager completely when teleporting away. The problem with stasis chambers is that to trigger a remote stasis chamber, we need the chunk that it is in to be loaded. In order to do this, we can use two chunk loaders and use a nether communication system between them to trigger the stasis chambers. Here's the base system. It's a pretty simple chunk loader. We just send an item through and back through every couple of seconds. When we want to send a signal through to the other chunk loader, we just send a special item to the nether side where it's filtered and the signal is sent to the other chunk loader, which sends another special item to the overworld where it's again filtered. And then we send our signal to trigger the stasis chamber. This works really well for the stasis chamber functionality, but there's a big problem. Since we're loading the chunks here to load the stasis chamber, we also end up loading our villager, which kills the functionality for infinity trading completely. With chunk loaders or portal loading in general, we load the equivalent to a simulation distance of one chunk. So a total of a seven by seven area is loaded. So if we want a villager close to our stasis chamber, the best we can do is in the lazy chunks, which just doesn't work. We can fix this by putting our villager out past the lazy chunks, which works perfectly. This is not a new concept. Cubic Meter introduced it as an option for overworld void trading in one of his videos on the topic. The problem is that having to walk over 32 blocks is at best not very smooth. So is there a better solution? Well, perhaps, but I have to say, we are now entering an area that may be out of the realm of best practices. The technical Minecraft community is generally full of responsible people who want to build systems that follow fundamental principles of good design. Then there are people like me who are just really curious and frankly, just want to make things work. So can we accomplish that? Well, maybe. So the big question is, what is the actual purpose of the chunk loader? You might think it's to load the stasis chamber, like I described, but this isn't actually true. You see, a chunk loader loads the chunks all the time, and we don't actually need this. We just need the chunk to be loaded when we want to trigger the stasis chamber. See, when an entity is sent through the portal, it loads the other dimension for 300 game ticks or 15 seconds. But if they are sent less frequently than 15 seconds, then the link between the portals will be broken and the game will have to commit more resources to creating that link again, i.e. more lag. Essentially, the chunk loader in this application is minimizing lag, but by doing so, it's making us move our villagers two chunks away from the stasis chamber. So if we are willing to sacrifice game performance for convenience, then we can remove the chunk loading portion of this contraption. In this setup, it's quite easy. We just take the cycling item away and the chunk loader is gone. The communication is retained through this special filtered item. When the filtered item is sent through, it will load the nether 
for 15 seconds, which is enough time to send a signal here, which sends an item to the overworld, which will then load the overworld for 15 seconds, which is enough time to trigger the stasis chamber. Then we can do regular void trading with the villagers, even if they're right next to the portal. The only limitation is that we need to wait for the portal to stop loading the villager before we try to trade with it. Since a portal loads the overworld for 15 seconds, if we trade with the villager before that 15 seconds is up, the villager will remember that trade and not do infinity trading. In order to prevent this, I've made a system that uses a timer. Basically, when an item comes through the portal, it will use a pulse extender to delay triggering the opposite portal. You would think that the total trade cycle time would then be 30 seconds. But actually, if you implement some overlap to when the portals are loaded, you can reduce the cycle time. I'm using a cycle time of about 20 seconds, which gives 5 seconds to perform the trades and 5 seconds to set the new ender pearl, which I found works quite well. Then we just have villagers on both sides of the portal, so it ends up being one trade every 10 seconds, which is pretty close to normal void trading. You basically just open the trade menu, wait a couple of seconds, and then complete your trade when teleported. Reset your ender pearl in the station chamber and repeat. I'm pretty happy with this. It's certainly not as good as normal void trading, but for an option with this level of flexibility, it's not too bad. You should understand though, that it will cause some lag as we are a little bit outside of best practices. But as long as you monitor it and make sure it fits your game, then it should be okay. Be more careful on servers though, as the lag will peak when the portals are triggered, which can be harmful for other players. The good thing about this system is that you only use it occasionally, so you can choose to use it when other players are offline, or you can shut down other farms, etc. before using it to minimize the impact of these lag spikes. So implementing it into our existing hall is quite easy. I put the stasis chamber under this lovely pool fountain thingy. Did I mention that I'm an expert builder? Anyways, it's just a stasis chamber with an entry and an exit through the chamber itself. I'm calling this the infinity pod. We have a minecart rail to transport the villagers here and then back to the temporary storage when we're done. I could have done a villager cell like above, but honestly, I'm just being a little bit lazy at this point. After the infinity pod, we just have to set up the portal system and the communication between the two. I put my portal under Y0 to make linking a little bit easier. The location of the portal needs to be within one adjacent chunk of the stasis chamber, including the diagonal chunks. The ideal location will link with a portal on a chunk border in the nether, or at least pretty close to it. Then you can just make your other nether portal on the opposite side of the next chunk's border, or roughly 15 to 16 chunks away in the overworld. This will be enough in most situations, but still close enough so that both portals will always load the entire nether side of the system. For the remote stasis chamber, I just used the generated portal, verified it was an okay location, and built my chamber in that cave. Then just grabbed two villagers from the trading hall and sent them through those portals and did some quick breeding. The setup is more complicated than other types of void trading, but in the end, it's not really that bad for this level of flexibility. The part that can make it more complex is the optional portion, reducing the trade cycle time. If you maintain near a 30 second cycle time, the system should be quite robust and easy to use. But as you attempt to reduce the cycle time, both the installation of the system and the operation of the system gets more complicated. I would only really recommend this optimization for people who are interested in really digging into and understanding the system dynamics. You're always welcome to join the Discord to get some help if you are interested in that. Then it's just incorporating the infinity pod into the rest of the trading hall. And as promised in the last video, we will now go through the entire completed trading hall and give a brief overview. If you haven't seen the last single player series video, I would recommend that you check that out to get some context before we get into it. But first, I want to say that the concepts in these videos are a lot of fun to play with, but these videos are also a ton of effort. So if you like this content and have the means, please consider supporting my Patreon. It helps make this hobby into a more sustainable side gig that I can justify putting more effort into. I'm currently trying to beef up the perks and will be shouting out supporters of $5 or more in videos and providing early access to all videos for all supporters with more perks to come. If you don't have the means, then no sweat. 
We have an active Discord server and a free SMP server and would love to have you if you're interested in being more involved in the community. But with that said, let's get into the design of the trading hall. Basically, the hall is split up into two sections. Our holding cells, where the villagers normally are, then the processing system. The holding cells we covered in detail last video, so we will skip it here. The center of the processing system is our temporary storage. When we take a villager from their holding cell, they go directly to temporary storage. From here, we have five options. Back to the hall, zombification, the infinity pod, out of the system, and death. The basis of the system is a dual header. One header in, which is taking all the villager inputs and sends them into the temporary storage system, and one header out, which distributes the villagers to the different subsystems. We use a mumbo jumbo counting system to switch the rails to the correct position on the output header. There's one detail here that I want to highlight as it is a really critical part of real life engineering and was implemented here. The concept of fail state. With all of these branches off of the output header, if the connections for some reason are broken, say for instance, water clears all the redstone lines, the system would normally default to having the villager sent to the murder chamber, which as you can imagine, could have some really bad results if noticed too late. The system is designed so that if the redstone fails, the villagers are just sent back to the temporary storage, i.e. a safe fail state. Another fail safe is in case of overflowing the temporary storage system. I've set up what I'm calling the cold storage system, which has an alarm here if there are any villagers sent there. Then it has to be manually cleared, but can handle something like 20 villagers. While these are not the most glamorous parts of the system, the fail safe systems should help prevent any major problems from happening outside of human error. Another key to the system working smoothly is the ability to space the minecarts out. If they aren't spaced enough, they will come in too fast for the system to react and end up causing problems. The solution is basically just a slope to a fence gate that opens for a one tick pulse every couple of seconds to space the villagers out. We have it in both directions and longer for the input header since there is a longer delay between rail selector and the activator rail for the temporary storage system. The villager breeder is just a fence gate breeder hooked up to a dual auto carrot farm with then on off which bypasses the breeder. The breeder outputs to a methods style villager sorter and into a minecart system from iCraft MC to the temporary storage system. The zombie conversion chamber I really think needs to be improved and I may steal a design from the Mega Zero trading hall but it works okay for now. It just uses a trick with the string where the villagers hit boxes interact with the string, but a zombie villagers hit boxes don't. So as we remember from the last episode, observers detect when a hitbox enters and exits the string. So when the villager enters, it locks them next to the zombie. When converted, the hitbox no longer overlaps and the system opens and sends them away. It's a little janky, but it seems to work okay for the time being. For the zombie conversion system and the temporary storage system, I have to admit that I don't really understand rails very well, so I just kind of spammed rails with the guess and check method to get the systems to work. So this is why we have rails here and here. Without them, the rails change all over the place and make a real mess. These certainly can be improved, but they work decently well as is. Both systems use RS NOR latches that skip the cell when the input detector rail is activated and open it again when the output detector rail is activated. I have some ideas for improving them, including making the temporary storage system a one wide design, which I will include in the world download, but I haven't had the time to implement it in the single player yet. The last small system that honestly isn't even required is the minecart recycling system. Empty minecarts are sorted with string and an observer here. Then they are sent through the kill chamber since, well, the kill chamber also produces minecarts. Then they use a counting system and T flip flop to evenly distribute the minecarts. In the creative world, I also implemented an overflow, but haven't put that in survival yet. So overall, there were lots of little details that were fun to solve. 
I know that everything is not perfect and there may be some bugs, but we will hash those out as they are discovered. In general, I will say that I would really encourage you to look at the world download to help you come up with your own custom trading hall rather than just copy this one because it might be kind of buggy and in my mind is a work in progress meant for my single player rather than like a published design. But maybe you can steal some parts and improve others, which if you do, come share in the Discord. I will also be putting the trading hall in the Patreon only creative world and would love to see some ideas of how to improve it. The other thing I'm requesting help on is building, specifically some nice block palettes. I'm looking to stretch my building muscles a little bit by decorating the trading hall rather than having it be smooth stone. And I would really appreciate it if anyone has any tips or ideas for palettes and would come share them in the Discord server. But I think that's going to do it for this video. The next video will be a bit more of a chill progression video for a change of pace. Maybe end rating, which I'll probably stream. So look out for that if you are interested. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and goodbye. Pineapple.